We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show here. Uh, 144, Adapting and Evolving Your Inner Narrative. This is a very important concept uh, for me. It's um, it's an idea that comes from what's called narrative therapy. And um, as psychologists, counselors, therapists, clinicians, we're all very interested in the conscious and unconscious stories that individuals and clients tell themselves because we tend to act out those stories whether we know it or not. Uh, you know, we see the world through a schema, what's, uh, what's called a schema. This is kind of Piagetian. Um, developmental psychology. Um, it's a great topic. I actually really enjoyed studying it last uh, last trimester. And um, it's all about how our cognition develops and grows and we start to act out, you know, these meta constructs of, you know, being in a place, getting to a place. And I'm sure you could be able to, you know, figure that out for your own life. You know, if you really sat back into yourself and viewed your life as you currently being in point A and then moving towards a point B, I'm sure it actually wouldn't take you very long for you to start recognizing what those two points look like, you know, whether it's, you know, here you are now looking forwards to one day owning your home or paying off the mortgage or waiting till your kids are a bit older or getting a black belt in jujitsu or um, doing your first dance recital, I don't know. <laughs> but we always live in that construct of being in a place, moving towards um, another place. And sometimes when we don't have our narrative either well-defined, clearly articulated, um, when there are external forces that seem to be tyrannizing our ability to control our narrative, uh, certain uh, mental health issues can arise. So this idea of having a plan is really, really important and it's got to be challenging so we can actually get into what's called a flow state um not too challenging so that we you know we start to feel bogged down in the mud but you know you don't want it to be too easy either as otherwise you won't feel that your life has a sense of purpose and meaning and that there's a reason for you to get out of bed and this is where um um ideas like obligations and responsibilities can be really powerful but there's an idea in narrative therapy which i really enjoy and it's, uh, it's, it's the idea of writing yourself a new story. So when you actually take some time and you, you have a look back on the story that you tell yourself, if this is the first time you're doing it or you're new to therapy um, or you're working through some deep-seated issues, what you'll find is that your story to a large extent or the way you view yourself has actually been um, filtered by some, by some negative experiences that have happened to you. And... Uh, you know, this is a chapter in my book, but what you can do with writing is it helps to kind of consolidate these long-term memories with your, with, with who you are now as a much more kind of mature individual. And um, this can be extremely therapeutic. And there's a whole lot of research done by a, a social psychologist. I don't think he's actually undertaken any clinical practice, but uh, he's from the University of Austin, Texas, James Pennebaker. And he was doing a whole lot of research in the, in the late 20th century, 80s and 90s, about the actual physiological benefits that he gained um, from university students specifically, it was in this study, who were writing about traumatic experiences for 15 minutes a day, four days in a week. So it's not very much, but on average, the, uh, the students who were writing about these um, traumatic experiences were... Uh, far less likely to report sick days, far less likely to uh, go and speak to uh, the uni nurse or whatever it was um, relative to baseline. So what that means in the lab report, um, uh, nomenclature is essentially, you know, 
when 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 there's another group of people that haven't had any changes or you know no independent variables variables have been have been influenced by them that's the kind of the baseline level or where they were previously as well so it's fascinating stuff the power that um you know writing rewriting your narrative thinking about the story you tell yourself can actually have on your not only your mental well-being but your physiological well-being as well it's absolutely phenomenal and, and james pennebaker couldn't believe it himself when he was doing it now there's another thing that you want to think about when you're um when you're doing this stuff there's a difference between writing about traumatic experiences and then ruminating on them so ruminating is when people get into obsessive thinking downwards downward spirals um without it any kind of integration so it's important to you know gain awareness and this is what writing can do but then implementing the these new perspective shifts and you know maybe implementing is asking for help maybe integrating and implementing is speaking to someone because you don't know how to do that um but just simply ruminating can't be um isn't that beneficial and that's why he kind of limited it to 15 days 15 minutes of writing, I should say, excuse me, um, for, for four times only. So it's not actually an ongoing practice. It was just an acute, uh, the model of the study was acute. So looking at over four days, it's not exactly longitudinal, but, uh, fascinating stuff. And I wanted to kind of explore these ideas. And I wrote about this in a, in a chapter in my book and what I'm kind of speaking on now, um, I go in deeper into the research here and I've actually cited some of the studies as well for you, um, in the, in the references section. So yeah, really powerful stuff. I, th I think it's a, a therapeutic, um, process that everyone should know about. That's my dog just going nuts with a ball <laughs> and, um, one of my many thousands of dogs. And um, yeah, it's something I think um, you'll, you'll, you'll benefit a lot from. So just quickly, I just want to go over our one and only sponsor. So ISBN Services, there's a lot of people um, who reach out to me who are in the process of writing a book, have written their first manuscript, are doing their second, uh, interested in self-publishing, moreover going down the more conventional um, publishing process. And uh, for me, ISBN Services were fantastic for all of my books, all my three books. And they can do everything for you from um, interior design, exterior design, formatting, registration, graphics. Oh my God, she's going crazy. <laughs> ebook formatting, even as well. So you can do the audio book yourself, like I did, but paperback and ebook, you know, these guys are great. And you get to keep all the royalties uh, as well. So visit uh, www.icebeanservices.com and you can use the checkout code MINDMATE for 10% off as well. So I hope that helps, guys, and um, enjoy the show. Cheers. I've got to put... Jesus. <laughs> we'll see what I can do with this dog. I will talk to you soon. Bye. Chapter 18. Write yourself a new story. As vulnerable human beings, primitively speaking, we must eat certain foods that contribute to and maintain our biological systems, boosting our immune function, energy levels, protein synthesis, cellular regeneration, hormonal regulation, and overall health. We too have psychological needs. We want to feel like we contribute and belong to a tribe, a community of people who rely on us for their own well-being and connectedness, and who happen to like our company. We want to feel loved and respected and that our input, work, is meaningful and stands for something, that we have some sort of at least social responsibility. We must derive a sense of meaning, otherwise we're lost and aimless, bored, depressed and nihilistic, or at the very least, uncertain, which promotes anxiety. Figuring out what to do, now that the race for survival is no longer dire, famously noted by the previously cited existential psychotherapist Viktor Frankl, at least in the West, is no easy task. Figuring out what to do, now that our lives aren't frequently on the line, and what a win that is, has now become a question of figuring out what we want to do. We get to choose, but what should we do? Human beings tell stories. We tell stories because language, the evolved adaptive capacity for the sharing of knowledge, helps us learn from others. Sharing information verbally, fundamentally, means that we can learn without doing. Telling stories about ourselves and the world helps us to distinguish between what we know and what we don't know, what is safe and unsafe. We can, essentially, contain the world and ourselves within stories we tell, write, and, more to the point, understand, cognitively and affectively. We explore the unknown, the unknown being a physical and psychological place, 
and sometimes a combination of the two, and adapt to new environments, which sometimes means recognizing environments are unfortunately unadaptable. We then imitate those who are well adapted to those environments. We watch and learn. We play, like children play, to practice the game of adaptation implicitly, which is to say that we act and imitate without cognitive representation. We don't know why we do what we do. We play, essentially, to practice appropriate behavior in safe environments. We abstract action and imitation and play into ritual because these behaviors across time reigned pragmatically true constituted the most suitable course of action for exploration of the unknown. Over time, ritual becomes drama, myth, religion, and with further abstraction and representation, philosophy. Quote, We have spent hundreds of thousands of years watching ourselves act and telling stories about how we act. Writing your life story or writing about a significant experience that influenced your life story will help you understand it better. When you write about a specific and or overwhelming emotional experience, you are changing the way the experience of self is organized in the brain. The experience no longer is you. Moreover, it has become, as many of our past experiences fundamentally should, excluding necessary, adapted to traumatic events, i.e. touching the fire for the first time, an event that occurred in the past. It is something that happened to you. Containing the past leaving it where it belongs, is a common and worthy task within psychotherapeutic relationships. Without cognitive representation, specifically of traumatic events, i.e. this event changed the way I saw my abusive father, we remain trapped in the past. We behave accordingly, reacting to our father, an imprint of the past, without conscious awareness of our behavior. Quote, Trauma by nature drives us to the edge of comprehension, cutting us off from language based on common experience or an imaginable past. Our neurological, behavioral systems are much older than our capacity for self-awareness. Without appropriate cognitive conceptualization, we will get lost in subconscious action and imitation. Writing helps. Writing helps when we're unsure about things, unsure about ourselves, our physiological and psychological nature, not to mention nature itself, and ways to act in modern, moral societies. Writing helps us understand our past, giving reasons as to why we might be acting in certain ways in the present, and therefore what our lives might be like in the future if we continue to act accordingly. Writing helps us understand ourselves. From a neuroscientific perspective, writing transports emotionally charged experiences from the subcortical amygdala to the neocortex, specifically the medial prefrontal cortex. It maps our experiences so that we won't always and necessarily view them as dangerous or scary. Writing says, this is why this happened and this is why you did this. He hit you because he was struggling with his own issues. She betrayed you because she'd once been betrayed, not that this is by any means a get out of jail free card. In this way, writing reduces uncertainty because we are literally throughout the writing process, making sense of things, making sense of our lives. Then our anxiety levels will reduce in severity and frequency, proportional to our level of understanding and self-familiarity. When we write our own stories of experience, we consolidate our short and long-term memories. That is, which memories are necessary for sustained mental and physical health and well-being, and which memories are not which memories, storage containers of past experience, will help us in the unpredictable future, and which memories are irrelevant. The hippocampus in the limbic portion of the brain organizes and consolidates memory and helps with context and meaning of experience. If the hippocampus could introduce itself to you, it would say, Hey mate, based on past experience and current conscious and subconscious goal-directed behavior, this is what we need to know. This is what needs to be remembered. If anything similar were to happen again, I've got you covered. Expressive writing and the brain. Writing helps with the consolidation process because writing, hand thinking, slows and filters thoughts emanating from significantly affective experiences into coherent analytical structures. Put simply, we slow the mind down because we can't write as fast as we can think, and that slowing down helps us formulate our opinions, conceptualizations, and assumptions. Additionally, by doing so, we remind ourselves that the past is the past, not the present. 
The degree to which the past shaped or dramatically influenced our lives is open to interpretation and depends on our current emotional states. Expressive writing, therefore, is a call to cultivating greater awareness. Quote, The neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux and his colleagues have shown that the only way we can consciously access the emotional brain is through self-awareness, i.e., by activating the medial prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that notices what is going on inside us, and thus allows us to feel what we're feeling. Writing helps integrate emotionally charged experiences and beckons, forces, us to contemplate our lives and how they came to be. The future, once the past has been reconciled, is ours for the taking. We can end those shitty chapters and write new ones, akin to who we'd like to become. The intention behind writing your story, reflecting on a particularly significant experience or series of experiences, may be accurately described as the calligraphy of your life, as you currently perceive it, as autobiography. Self-reflective writing attempts to integrate consciously selected, emotionally significant experiences into the story of your life. Your story, no doubt, is the product and totality of events that made you you. So, you reflect on the experiences that shaped you as an individual, your worldview, and therefore perceived future. Reflective writing says, that was then, and this is now. To reflect means, of course, to cast your mind back to the illusory past. Illusory because it is no longer real, at least in the material world. Psychologically speaking, the past imprisons those of us plagued by traumatic and fearful experiences, suggesting that the past is not entirely illusory, at least not in the affective sense. There is a reason why people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder relive their frightening experiences and painful histories at night. They cannot get over the experience itself, cannot detach the subjectively overwhelming emotions from the objectivity of what occurred. Their past continues to define their present, continues to define who they are. Put simply, they are their past because they live it every day and live by it involuntarily. That said, trauma is subjective in nature and any fear-inducing event that altered the course of one's life may be accurately described as traumatic. Clinically Researched Benefits of Expressive Writing According to the American Psychological Association, quote, writing about difficult, even traumatic experience appears to be good for health on several levels, raising immunity and other health measures and improving life functioning. American social psychologist James Pennebaker, PhD from the University of Texas in Austin, proved that journaling, writing about traumatic life experiences, leads to positive mental and physical health benefits. Disclosing personal life events to oneself through the form of writing was and has since proven to be of significant utility. In 1986, Pennebaker asked his students to think of a deeply traumatic event in their lives. He then divided his classroom up into three groups. One subgroup wrote about that specific and difficult experience. The second wrote about something currently happening in their lives. And the third subgroup, quote, would write about the details of the traumatic experience, their feelings and emotions about it, and what impact they thought this event had had on their lives. The group wrote diligently for four consecutive days. 15 minutes at a time. This was no joke either. The students revealed secrets and events in their lives they'd never told anyone else prior to Pennebaker's research. Of the 200 participants, 22% of women and 10% of men reported sexual trauma prior to the age of 17. Many of the students expressed deep emotional and unresolved pain pertaining to the myriad of ways in which traumatic events are quite literally stored in the body, not merely the mind. Some of the students reflected upon the journaling exercise. Quote, It helped me think about what I felt during those times. I never realized how it affected me before. I had to think and resolve past experiences. One result of the experiment was peace of mind. To have to write about emotions and feelings helped me understand how I felt and why. Six weeks after the writing sessions, students in the trauma group reported more positive moods and fewer illnesses than those writing about everyday experiences, indicating that journaling appeared to have a significant effect not only on mental health, but on physical health too. 
Pennebaker also noted that writing about painful experiences was physically beneficial as students reported fewer visits to the student health care centre, all things considered. Specifically, the research saw improved measures of cellular immune system function. Pennebaker also applied his research to other settings too. At the Dallas Memorial Center for Holocaust Studies, he and his colleagues videotaped interviews with more than 60 Holocaust survivors while taking their physiological measurements. Later, they classified each survivor based on the interview as a low, mid-level, or high disclosure. High and mid-level disclosures were significantly healthier a year after the interviews compared to the low disclosures. Finally, in a study titled Expressive Writing and Coping with Jod Loss, Pennebaker et al. asked 63 recently unemployed professionals to write about their job loss and their related thoughts and feelings. Those who expressively wrote, quote, were re-employed more quickly than those who wrote about non-traumatic topics or who did not write at all. Pennebaker was able to show that disallowing oneself the act of moving through or processing significant life events led to psychological and physiological stresses. His findings from the late 80s suggested that keeping a secret, and perhaps more importantly, the shame surrounding personally significant and traumatic experiences, literally reduced immune function. Specifically, the body and mind aren't meant to withstand chronic cortisol spikes. Chronic cortisol spikes have been linked to myriad physiological and mental disease, including anxiety and depression, a loss of libido, and type 2 diabetes. Furthermore, sustained high cortisol levels leads to weight gain and kills brain cells. Ironically, we often glorify those within our proximal friendship circles known for their secret keeping abilities. Good for us, not so good for them. Next time you see them, remind them the powers of open, honest communication. This is why knowing and owning your story will prove, and it has clearly with others, to be the missing ingredient when it comes to writing a new one and making long-lasting lifestyle changes. Remember, you'll get lost if you don't know where you're going. No truer words were spoken. For millennia, our sole aim was to not die. Maybe in the pursuit of that aim, we'd see to it that our loved ones live too, and now we thrive. We've lost our aim because we're not always in everyday in mortal danger. Overindulgence and boredom are real, so we must choose our aims. Who are you and who do you want to be? Where do you want to live and with whom? What kind of job do you want and how would you want to be remembered? All of the above are worth considering in order to negate that anxious snake that slithers beneath your skin throughout your morning commute. There is a life out there to be lived. Go live it. Intrinsic and meaningful pursuits are actualized only when individuals are able to sink into the truth of who they are, how they have become themselves, and therefore rise up to who they one day hope to be. It all starts with writing and owning your story.